Syntech. Welcome to another episode of Meet the Grower. Today, we have an extremely knowledgeable individual on the show today. I am super stoked to welcome Smokey from Smokey Ridge Organics. Brother, welcome. Awesome. Thank you for having me, man. I really appreciate it. Oh, I'm totally stoked to have you here, man, as I am with most guests. However, yeah, you, sir, are a little different in that I met you through the Discord. You came on on one of our interactive discussions and gave some amazing talk on oh. KNF and natural farming and organics. So I thought, what better way to, you know, get you a little bit more known, introduce you to some of my viewers and have you on the show. So, you know. I, I really appreciate it, man. The opportunity, it's awesome. Awesome. Sharing the love, sharing the knowledge, you know. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Hey, and that's what we're all about here on the show. Right. That being said, a uh, couple of housekeeping items, as always, shout out to the sponsor, Mars Hydro. If you guys are looking for a grow light, Mars Hydro makes some excellent ones. And if you like the show, like what we're doing here, link below to the Patreon. Never hurts to show me a little love. I do appreciate it. That being said, Smokey, brother, let's get to talking about growing. Let's get talking about KNF and organics and all that cool stuff. However, first, let's talk about you. Give me a little background on, you know, who you are, some of the highlights that have brought to you to, to where you are in this uh, point in life now. All right. Well, that's a long one. Some, uh, <laughs> some of the, you know, I, I got into cannabis and everything. I was late. You know, I'm from uh, from North Carolina, born and raised. You know, it's prohibition state. They're pretty heavy with it still. And, uh, you know, uh, I started smoking. And as soon as I started smoking, I uh, wanted to start growing. Um, I was raised on a farm. My grandfather had an aquaponics, a greenhouse little one that we spent our entire childhood in. And so I just immediately started growing and getting into that. And went through college here and graduated and right after college a buddy and i just packed up and moved to colorado to be able to full commit and be in it and do it and not and no worries and and all the things and uh, got into the medical market out there and just worked as much as we could did the things we could um went to california ran a farm out in california after i left colorado um did that for a year. That was super nice and, and such a, a build of knowledge. What I gained in that, that time span in Cali, man, uh, getting out. I was up in Humboldt and uh, getting out, taking some seminars and uh, diving a little bit deeper down the soil rabbit hole and, and what that could provide. And I've always been organics, but I've, uh, I haven't delved into soil until California came. And once I got into California, I was all about it. I wanted the soil. I love the soil. I love Deppin. I've been Deppin since this, since then. It's, it's been my, I just love it. I love every part of that. And, uh, went from there, bought, uh, used that, that I gained to be able to buy my farm in Colorado. And I bought a, a, a just a plot of land in Colorado and went out there, took a camper and developed the whole thing that I, as much as I could and built my little farm and, uh, ran that. And I did that for several years and worked a couple rec farms out there and uh, bounced around for through a different couple different farms. You know, the uh, the industry's tough. They don't want to pay you nothing anyways. You know, they want you there because you know what you're doing. They don't want to give you no money. Yeah, that's and, typical. Uh, <laughs> typical. I mean, it was a typical thing. So I went around to a few different ones. And, and then I started a business back in North Carolina, got into hemp, got into CBD actually had a buddy of mine, John from Colorado Natural Farming, one of my super close friends, and he sent me a gram of CBD shatter. And it was grown by uh, Tony from West Creek Hemp. Okay. And so uh, he had grown this variety. My buddy turned it into shatter and then he gave it to me to try. And it changed my game. You know, the whole thing like totally uh, sold me, you know, I was not into it. And then I, cause I was like, I got my meds, I'm okay. And then it happened. And within six months, I uh, had business licenses in North Carolina. Cause I knew I could be back here and do it. Uh, and we were setting up shop and setting up the farm and I left the farm in California or in Colorado and made my way back here and I've been set up in the mountains ever since. And we're up in the, the Smokies. So it, it, Hill strong. And I always had Smokey from being back here in Carolina. And it's so fitting to be able to be back in here and uh, be a part of this community and, and get in. And I've just been growing and uh, trying to adapt to this climate ever since. You know, we got a lot more 
uh, issues here to try and battle just your your natural enemies, bugs and things. And and so that has definitely adapted me as a, a grower to really stay on my toes, constantly be aware of uh, what is happening because they're uh, out here, it's easy for something to take over fast. And, and so, you know, I've just adapted that. And, and now I'm running a, a hemp shop. Uh, we've got a wholesale distribution. Um, I'm, I've been working in genetics for a number of years. So uh, starting to get into the hemp side of it, we're producing our own varieties so that we keep it all in-house. Trying to do the uh, seed, the sh- uh, seed the shelf, the whole vertical farming idea of what it is. I really feel like that's where we're headed. You know, if you want to hold on to anything, you got to have some kind of craft and you got to really keep it all in-house. If uh, Very little can go outside of it if you're going to maintain against the conglomerates that we're, we're battling now. Oh, totally, totally, for sure. I mean, corporate just wants to worm its way in here. And I know it's going to be a squeeze on the smaller grower. Totally. So that brings around a question then, organics in general, but more so KNF. Uh Tell me what attracted you to natural farming to begin with and how you've gone along that journey so far. So natural farming got me because, uh, as most people, getting into to farming and growing my own meds and doing, I ha- had to be affordable. Oh, yeah. uh, I had to be able to make a balance of knowing where I could sacrifice, knowing where I couldn't sacrifice, knowing my everything. And so I started reading and just going through the organics books and the soil food web and Elaine Ingham and uh, Chris Trump and everybody and going through through everything. and. I, I just started exploring and experimenting. I'm constantly experimenting and uh, uh, trying new things, new mixes, just to see, you know, it's everything can balance around and uh, everything is different in different climates. That's a great thing about KNF and learning my plants that are here and, and what I have, the, the natural enemies and everything. And, and I, I've always done it, uh, balanced it indoors as well, doing KNF indoors. It's, it's hard doing it indoors. It's really hard to balance that. Uh, but I, I've just always done it and, and kept it going. And, uh, and, and I, enjoy, I enjoy greenhouse. I love greenhouse grows is my my big thing i feel like you get in the sun you can supplement light you can uh tap into the earth and with knf i really feel like that holds the roots of it is uh, being able to get into the soil that's the whole point of it the soil of your area the terroir of what you are in your appalachia of uh, of of all of it of where we are and, and all the good things so I, I try and keep everything in the soil or bring a little bit of that soil inside um and I always, everywhere I go, I'm making fresh, uh, fresh stuff. And it's it's a it's a wormhole of, of wormhole of science. You know, I I really got into the the exploration of like being able to take, uh, you know, rice, starting with rice and ending with a rich soil that is just ready to roll and being able to walk around my property and see plants and know that they are there and they're there for a reason. That's the whole reason behind it. There are no weeds. Uh, the only thing that makes a plant a weed is perspective, you know, and so you've got, uh, uh, you've got access to just nutrients. You've got access to dynamic accumulators. You've got all of this that's just right there uh, and it's right outside your door. And so after getting down that KNF hole and, and, uh, going through what that is and uh, just experimenting, I was hooked, you know, and then, I mean, it brought me uh, deeper. I was teaching classes and doing seminars out in Colorado and working with a couple buddies out there and went through New Mexico into Texas a few times and uh, did some lectures down there. And, you know, one of my most accomplished things so far that I hold is I got a, um, a conventional farm, a large scale conventional farm to switch to KNF. And that was super rad. Like that, that felt awesome. awesome. Like these dudes came back four months later and, uh, you know, they were, they were already full commit. They had already sectioned off different areas of fields where they were going to cultivate certain plants so that they knew that that could be there for feeding later. And, you know, they were even going down the wormhole of sugar beets on your farm and raising the sugar beets and processing that down and being able to uh, create your ferments and, 
And that's a heavy one too, a, a super awesome one. And they already had that going. So they were just, they were super stoked to adapt what they were already doing and didn't realize they could go outside of conventional. And, uh, you know, that, that was, that was pretty awesome getting people getting them hooked. And that's one of the big things with KNF too, is that, you know, you start talking about it and people are like, what are you talking about? It's like some alien foreign language. Oh, yeah. And then look at it and they're just hooked instantly being like, man, this is just wild. It's so simple yet. So effective. Oh, totally. Totally. And I've started dipping my toes into the water. I've, I've got a bottle of uh, FPJ sitting uh, beside me here, some fermented plant juice. That's from my boy, Riot. Thanks, Riot. That's and, right. uh, you know, just some of the other stuff. It's it's fantastic uh, way to explore and learn about growing. Now, yeah. that being said, let's talk a little bit about your grow space in general. I mean, you, you've got indoor, you've got outdoor, you've talked about greenhouse. Uh, mm -hmm. What are some of the challenges that have helped you evolve over time? Uh, you know, really being present uh, has yeah. helped me the most and being uh, in and out. And I, I will run some things true. You know, we're, we're learning a lot with LEDs. LEDs have come a long ways. And so it's been, um, I, I've got friends that dabble in LEDs and they see good results and I see them from all over the board. Uh, so I, I haven't jumped down the LED train yet. You know, I'm, I'm going there. I'm going there, but it's going to be the right one. Right now, I've been running ceramic metal highlights. Yep. It's pulling less power, but I feel like I get a better terpene profile off of everything than uh, than what I was with my thousand watts. And um, and so through seeing that and seeing the turp profiles change, you know, I evolved and switched my lighting up, and then. Um, you know, airflow was always my biggest thing. I saw your one today from the the fan man. That that is that is super dope, and that yeah. uh, that rotating fan is is super clever because uh, that's super important. I've seen people without the airflow, and I'm constantly on people, man. Your airflow, like you got to come in from all sides. Okay. You know, I had I had fans out in a, a hoop house, and I had them all blowing one direction. It was all directional, but the back side of the plants were getting betrayed because you know, I, I was having it come from the other way and there was just too much stagnancy in one side of it. And so me being able to take and, uh, and, and learn my, my airflows, my patterns, my things, all of the stuff like that is, uh, has helped me outside and balancing my soil and, uh, and seeing what's here in the KNF really easy for me to adapt outside. Uh, the inside has come down with, um, you know, just running my lights, keeping the airflow, uh, my water, you know, my tech is super simple. Uh, I grow with the intention of we all have personal lives outside of this plant that we love. And, uh, and to be able to manage that, sometimes we might not be able to put quite in the love that we want and or the time that we want. And so I keep everything that I do super simple. All my genetics, man, I push everything <laughs> stupid hard, you know, and, and if it survives me, bro, like if it survives my life, then it can survive other people's lives. You know, <laughs> I used to give them plants to some of my buddies who were just awful, awful. I know nothing about plants at all. And I'd be like, he take care of it for two weeks, you know, and whichever one's lived. I'm like, the ones that lived, that's the one. <laughs> that's the ultimate the stress test. That's the stress test, you know, so if they can pull through that and do and, and manage what I'm pushing out and putting them through, um, then everything is good. So I keep my tech super low. My lights are running. I got fans going, keeping my water. Uh, you know, I, I ain't checked pH in a long time. I don't really use pH pins, you know, I, and it's a lot of it's soil anyways. And the stuff that I'm using, I, it's so consistent with me as well. I'm confident in what I'm getting out of it uh, so that that helps me to feel more confident and uh, not adapting and getting, you know, I've ran CO2, I've done all this stuff and, and I'd like to get CO2 back in my tents, but uh, with being gone and not being present at times and having to leave for a certain amount of times, uh, I feel like that is asking for failure somewhere when you're leaving uh, a lot of things uh, setting and you're relying on pumps and CO2 to cut on and your fans rotating and everything to cut off when it needs to and cut on when it needs to. And, uh, and, and all of it. I've done light tracks, you know, uh, uh, they, they'd move my lights around. I had a, an eight by eight with 315 lights in it. You know, they're like a three by three space, you know, at max. And I'm like pushing them to four by four, but I put them on light movers to try and get a little rotation going around. And 
and you know you get off by a second of those those light movers not tracking right and eventually in the night you're going to have some kind of hookup happening and and I'm going to come in the next day here and cat 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 you know and I run into oh, the no. tent they're just hooked <laughs> and hanging on each other and uh so you know I've I've learned little things that that will work and those things that don't work the light movers you got to drop some money and get the nice ones I went the cheap route it ain't going to work you know the same thing with lights you know you go to cheap route it ain't going to work you know, yeah. you're going to, everything's going to work, you know, to a degree, but is it going to be what you want out of it? Is it going to be the, the meds that you want out of it? Probably not, you know? So yeah, I keep everything super simple just because of that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's funny because when you're getting started growing, I mean, there's all these big shiny things that you want to buy fancy fans and D hues and, and gear itself is, well, that's just another story, but can you yeah. tell me about a time when a piece of equipment has let you down? Boy, who has not flooded yeah. a grow? <laughs> you, are, <laughs> boy, I, I have, I have flooded my fair share. I've flooded buddies' grow rooms, you know, for something not cutting off on me. Uh, but I think my biggest loss on a piece of failed equipment was a 600 watt bulb in a friend's place. Whenever I was in Colorado, I was, I had an off grid farm. My whole farm was ran off of solar power and wind oh, turbines. Cool. And I installed and put everything and built it all from scratch. So everything was powered off of, it was totally regenerative. Like everything I was doing was to be a regenerative farm. And I couldn't sustain through the winter, my plants and the warmth that I needed through a Colorado winter. Uh, in the San Luis Valley, it's, you know, the coldest that ever got out there was a negative 27.9 degrees. So I couldn't sustain that, yeah. you know, in, in my camper and keep plants alive. So I put them at a buddy's house. And while he had them, a bulb blew up. And luckily he was home because the hot glass landed on a thing of rags down on the floor and caught on fire. Wow. And uh, he was home and saw the smoke and got outside and got it out before it burned down anything and hurt anybody. So nobody was hurt. The building didn't burn down, but it was right beside of my plants. So I lost all my mothers, you know, and I had uh, <laughs> I had so many generations that I had gone through. I was like made the selections. I had done a 600 plant pheno count that year and I had four of them that I kept. Oh, out of. <laughs> and they died, you know, they were burnt up and, uh, and I had a few other varieties that I'd gotten from some of the farms I'd been associated with and all of them were grown, you know, but I, I was grateful that nobody was hurt and that my buddy didn't lose his property. I mean, it could have been a disaster. You know, those are the stories you hear about and, you know, California, where you burnt down 10,000 acres. And, and so I was super, you know, if I lost just those plants and, and a season's worth of, of a hunt, then whatever, I can hunt some more later. But that was probably my biggest tech failure was a yeah. you know, side pH pins going out. Those are, those aren't super detrimental, but that light blowing up and catching some stuff on fire was, that was scary. Oh, totally, totally. I mean, it, I'm not gonna lie. That probably takes the cake for um, a worst thing to happen in the grow space that I've heard about. I mean, whew, <laughs> that is just ouch. Yeah. Flip side to that, though. I, what about the most important piece of equipment in your grow room? Yeah. What is it, and why? I brought, that, I brought that with me because I keep my tech so simple. Yeah. Uh, you know, lights are great. Uh, environmental controls are great. All of that is awesome to get really good flower. Uh, but for me, it is this digital microscope. And that is my most used tool in the garden. I yeah. can more easily identify pests and bugs, and I can tell uh, when everything is really ready. And that is super important to me. You know, I can balance my lights uh, being there. And the same thing with environmentals, I can balance that with whatever. But uh, this, little, this little scope right here, is the best tech that i've got oh for sure for sure and scoping is so important i've said it many many times you got to get in that grow every day look at your plants see what's going on because something is going to change at some point and if you miss it well bugs, bugs. Let's, touch, let's touch on bugs <laughs> I, I i've bugs. had spider mites and thrips and fortunately no broader russet mites anything like that actually i just finished i'm hoping fingers crossed dealing with some thrips uh mm. you know cucumeris for the win but how about yourself yeah. there, Smokey? Tell me about some times when maybe you didn't win the battle against the Bucks. So I'm still 
battling russets, they are a never ending little army. And, you know, I've done all, listened to all the podcasts, gone through all the things and trying to keep everything as organic as I can. And I've been using sulfur, wettable sulfur here recently to try and uh, get that back down. But man, I, you know, where I'm at in Carolina is I've gotten some weird bugs that have come in and have been eaters, plant eaters. And uh, the russets are what have been the only thing that I have really lost the battle to. Now, spider mites, you let them get out of control and, and they'll tear you up. But you can get that under control uh, for me a little easier than russets. You know, russets have been the worst thing to be able to get under control for me. And I have aphids that just fly around outside because I'm <laughs> the, where I live at the farm that I'm on now. You know, we rent a house. And, and so the guy's cool with me growing, but he grows uh horse quality hay and there's 20 acres beside of me so that is just full of bugs and full of aphids and so i am at a constant battle of aphids because they i'm bringing them in i'm taking them out i'm just they're everywhere they're always there so i am always in a state of treatment uh with them and that's just your ipm you know man managing a uh, steady consistent treatment with everything and uh and that's been good. I've done a few full flushes, pulling the plants out, going from, not from scratch. I'll never take it to scratch. You know, I'll, I'll never, I'll never succeed the battle in that front to, to lose everything. Yeah. So I have lost a couple of my varieties due to russets. And it was males, male plants that I had in, in my breeding that, uh, they were getting sickly. And I noticed that something was happening and, and like I said, my, my time, I run three businesses. I got a wife and a son and I still work a full-time job on top of all of this to, you know, pay the bills and just live life, you know, it's, and, and so me putting off two, three days from something, uh, you know, is, is detrimental. And, and I've lost uh, maybe two males to russets that were ones that I had done predictive testing on and done the whole thing i went through the whole process with them had them selected and then damn russ it's got me you know like well there's 150 dollars down the drain you know like but but that's it russets are <laughs> russets are my 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 getters right now but i got a lot of stuff that's happening to, to get them and you know and i've listened to a bunch of podcasts i've i was listening to uh a suzanne bug lady yep. uh she's so uh she has said she's never seen a bug that will really get away russets that will get it under control russets specifically and that's the only bug that she's seen that's they've not had success with just predatory uh bugs of, of whatever they are and and i've tried a bunch of different predators um all since christmas man uh i've been trying just predator after predator after predator dropping them in and and really the only thing that's starting to get them under control is whenever i use the uh the sulfur and the sulfur has been uh, helping a lot. And I'm going to have to continue treating that now that I'm at the end of the season. And I'm, you know, it's easy to take it all outside, set it outside during the summer and spray it when it needs it and do good. Now I'm starting to get fall. I got to be bringing everything back in and it's harder to maintain all that stuff indoors, the, the treatments and things like that. Certain things you don't want to spray or I don't want to release ladybugs in my basement, <laughs> you know, still doing the basement grows and things. So, you know, I'll, I'll keep the non movers down there, but yeah, it's it. <laughs> the russets are my damn, they're my nemesis right now, man. <laughs> oh yeah. I've, I've heard so many um, tales of russet and broad mites and just the battles that growers go through to get Pretty through. I, you know, I've, I've grown for, since I was 15 and I'm 35 and I have never battled russets until the last year. I've never had them. And, and it's there, there now though. Now I'm learning them fast. I tell you. <laughs> yeah, it just makes me scared talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> talking a bit more now about some of the community. What do you feel we could do to reduce the stigma more around cannabis? Uh, you know, so I'm, I'm really active in uh, the politics of what cannabis is here in Carolina. Uh, I have been traveling back and forth to the Capitol, speaking to Senate committees, uh, talking with reps and doing the things. And I, our biggest stigma, man, right now is that people see us as these lazy stoners. And 
someone, you know, I already have tattoos and dreads and fit the lazy stoner image. But whenever I get in front of people and start talking, we really have to sound educated. Yeah. You know, and we, we have to speak clearly and, uh, and and have information to back our claims. Uh, and, and I think that's a that's a huge one is, is just breaking through to let them see that we are everybody. We are 80 percent of the population, um, you know, and. Uh, communicating openly, more openly and confidently with it, uh, not trying to hide anything or feeling shame because we are in the 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 community or because we smoke or whatever. You know, I mean, I wear, I, I call them my band t-shirts, any of my grocers, like the Moon Made Farms is outlaw, what does this say? Outlaw country, you know, big, big leaf. And, uh, and I wear this out in public. I have uh, all the things I try to talk to everybody and, and, and let them know what it is. I, I go to events. We, um, you know, we just have to break that, that viewing of where people look down on us because we're lazy stoners. And, yeah. and it's, I hear that so often, but it's, it's in a, um, in a form where when I'm talking to people, they're like, now it's shocking talking to you because I've always imagined just lazy stoners. And that is what comes from people who don't smoke or aren't involved in the industry or don't work with any of this or do anything. They're just like, you know, you're sh it's shocking talking to you because I wouldn't imagine this. I didn't know that, or I didn't know this or whatever. And when we talk uh, more affluently, you know, and we're more educated behind our words, uh, people will take us seriously and then they will actually absorb this information. And I think that's our biggest struggle right now is getting away from this, you know, everybody does it. It's fun. The, the gram dabs, you know, the big globbers and things like that. Like everybody wants to do it and stuff. But when you see people out that don't partake and those are some of the people that make our decisions for us, they see that as irresponsible. And, you know, we see it as fun in games and it is fun in games you know, but uh, they don't want to see that a lot. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a difficult line to balance. So how to behave in front yeah. of those that, that get to dictate. That's a real good way to look at it. You know, when you're hanging out with the crew, hanging out with the boys, it's okay to dude it up. Yeah. If you're trying to bring the message though, of, of change, of medicine, of, of this great plant that we, we so much enjoy, uh, just bringing education around with you, Absolutely. Excellent, excellent way to look about it. What about new growers, though? How can we help them out? What can we do more to help new growers out? I, I, encouragement, yeah. uh, I think, is the biggest thing. You know, this is a, a super tough, a super difficult industry uh, to partake in. Um, if you're wanting to partake in the industry, you know, it's super difficult to get in uh, and stay in and keep the heart in it. You know, so many people get uh, disheartened and are just uh, feeling down and you know, just beat up from years of uh, regulation and taxation and all the things, you know, so the new growers get super excited and, and that's awesome. You know, the guy who actually brought me to you that introduced me to this and brought me in is a relatively new grower yeah. and CJ and he's, you know, he's super excited and, and just ready, ready for it all. And, and, you know, and it, it's excited as someone who's been in it for so long and man, you know, the, the way it beats you down after a while, it's hard to stay positive and stay motivated and having people like that around you <clears throat> is encouraging to lift your spirits back up and get that fire lit back under you and encouraging them to stay with it. And us uh, sharing this community and, the knowledge and our experience and where something may benefit somebody that, you know, this is something that I learned, you know, the, the light hangers, you know, someone who's excited and new, I'm going to get light hangers to move around. It'll do this. Well, you know, this is my tidbit and, and us sharing the information. That's another thing I love about k &F. You know, the whole principle is based off of sharing this information and making sure the world receives it. Uh, you know, the fine details of it are, are, profitable, whatever. There's people out there, everybody makes money off of, uh, off of everything. But the general idea of what KNF is, 
is about being free, is about sharing. It's, it's the idea to change the world. You know, that, that is it. That's how we can do it is sharing the information, sharing FPJ with somebody. I've sent OHN out, man. I got OHN is four years old, (laughs) you know, that's three, it starts pumping, you know, and, and I've had nutrients that I've made years ago and, and I'm starting to use them more, but giving them out, educating people on them uh, and, and all the things is, is the whole principle behind KNF. And, and we need to treat all of the newcomers to cannabis with that same idea, you know, hear them uh, when they try to talk about uh, their grand ideas of what's coming and all the things. It's awesome. You know, I love it. It's, you know, it lights the fire under everybody and it's exciting, but uh you know, keeping them motivated, keeping everybody informed. And if someone's having a problem with bugs, helping them identify the bug and and a way they can treat it. You know, it's, we're all here for the medicine and the same reason. And yeah, I've seen it so many times, especially in Colorado, whenever I started getting into hemp and working more on a consulting side and getting into bigger areas within the industry, um, I was hearing different things and it was like this, disheartening things where Walmart, you know, was specifically talking to one of the farms out there and what it would be to set pound prices for what they would be making with their oils and things in preparation and, and setting a market standard that's really cheap. And, you know, the only way, and, and Walgreens tried to do it, you know, they tried to get in and they had a debacle that I think it was Walgreens that had a debacle uh, with uh, something in the FDA and things had to get pulled. And, and there's a few other ones that are big players that are just waiting to jump in and, and we need to invite everybody. This is a massive table, huge table to be able to eat at. <clears throat> it's not like it's a pie with 12 slices. This is a never ending pie and they're just consistently coming out of the oven. Uh, we've got new adaptations, new innovations, new uh, edibles and flower products. And, uh, you know, everything is constantly evolving within cannabis. And the more we're able to study it, the more it's evolving. And the more we embrace each other, the more likely we are to take back hold of our industry rather than losing it to these conglomerates because we're so in competition with each other and trying to cut out the new guys, the small guys, rather than inviting them to the table and hearing what they have to say. Yeah. You know, I've been cut out by several people and you know, it's here and or there for me, you know, it's whatever. But, you know, the position that I've gotten myself in now, I know that I'm in a bunch of different position that they would want to be a part of my team. And and a lot of them have reached back out and I don't try to shut people out, but uh, you've got to learn your lessons as to how people treat you. And and they're going to do the same thing to other newbies that are coming in and other new people coming in. And and when you're shutting people out, you're ultimately allowing for the big conglomerates to come through the door. You know, so we we got to maintain control and embrace everybody and us supporting each other is, is how we're going to do it. Me repping the shirt, buying merchandise from other farms. You know, that, that's how we do it. We, we support each other, small and big alike. For sure. It's, it's so important to embrace the enthusiasm of the new grower and help foster them along because it, I've been gardening for, for a long time. I've been growing cannabis for about three years here, but you know, it's, it's, it's not the same. It really isn't going from, you know, growing tomatoes to growing cannabis. I mean, most of it's transferable, but there's so many different things to take into account, take into consideration. And, you know, it, I just love helping new growers out because every person that we can keep growing is just one less person going and spending dollars on corporates. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Bring, bring it back to KNF now. Uh, what about, Somebody starting off in KNF. I, advice for myself. I, you know, should I start off an IMO? Is it better to do a fermented plant juice? What <clears throat> piece of advice would you give to me, someone getting into the game? So, um, there's a few ideas of KNF that are like your staples. You know, you, you don't want to just use one item um, because you're like just the FPJ having just the FPJ. You know, that is a sugar juice. So by spraying that on your plants, you're inviting bugs, though they absorb it and soak it in and all the things, but it's because it's just it by itself. So a lot of times the recommendation is uh, starting off with a couple of the inputs in the beginning, and FPJ is a good one, 
And then if you can get like a brown rice vinegar or, or a vinegar of sorts, you know, vinegars have different nutritional value. If you really break them down and get into what rice contains nutritionally, what coconut contains nutritionally, they have vinegars from all of them. And so whenever you're gathering what these these nutrients are within the item that you're buying, you know, you can balance out with any of them. And I use coconut and brown rice vinegar. I found both at the grocery store. And I will use those equal parts with the FPJ. And that helps balance out uh, your uh, pH as well as the sugars that are going to stick to the plant. So that's a really good blend to at least start off, you know, FPJ, brown rice vinegar. Um, let's see, uh, the, the IMOs and lab, you know, those, those two kind of can go hand in hand. You know, you can... Uh, rinse your rice, soak your rice in the water and, and, and situate it around, do all the things and then pour that off and be able to use that rice water in your making of your labs. And, and as you're making that going, and then you just begin that process, you know, from, from there, that begins both your IMO and your labs are being knocked out at the same time. You, you make the rice water, you then cook the rice and then it just goes into your station wherever you're set up uh, and, and putting that. So it becomes super easy to, to hit those two at the same moment. And it's like you you get to just hit these in the in the right order. And two weeks later, you are sitting with your labs made and you've got uh, IMO one done and you're moving on to uh, IMO2 quickly and, and your labs are stored and your IMO2 is now in, in your sugar and you're, you're already ready to use it at that point. You can throw it in water. And so you are ready. You've got labs, you've got uh, indigenous happening right then. And then if you've got FPJ already made and you've got a brown rice vinegar, I mean, you're, you're kind of ready to roll there. You're, you're hitting some good notes. And those are the beginning things that can, can get you happening. And, and another thing is the, the idea of FPJ being isolated to plants, to single plants. Now I've done it in all the ways I've, I got jars downstairs of uh, just dandelions that I collected from the field out here, go out, you know, the early morning dews and I pull them up by the root and everything have buckets. You know, I make, I tend to make mine in five gallon buckets. So it'll last for a while, but I go out and make as much as I can. And then I've got burdock that grows in the yard and, and I'm sourcing all of these and I will make them individually, but then I will also go in and make things uh, together. And another one that I brought up, it's not really a, a tech, uh, but I, I wrote it in the old Rodell's. I love Rodell's gardening books, man. This guy's got them. But I just wrote this in my own. Oh, let me find it. And it is, uh, you can't really read it that good, but it is a list of dynamic accumulators. Now, you can find this just on Google, Googling. I just rewrote it in here so I would never lose track of it. Yep. And you, I went through it at that point, looked through the list, and I had to adapt. There wasn't calcium in, uh, in the list I found online. So with what I did, I, I found calcium. I went through the plants that had that added to that. Then I go back through the list, and I find the plants that, uh, that I actually have growing near me somewhere. And I collect all those up and I put them all in the same permit. And that way I know that I'm getting all of my nu nutrient value, at least within that. So it's not limiting. You know, if you get just a single plant from me, just the dandelions, you know, then I I'll be lacking in some type of nutritional value somewhere yeah. uh, by not having a blend. So I always make my FPJs a blend of uh, either fruit, or whatever I'm putting in it, uh, I make it a blend. And the, the vinegar is just the vinegar. And then your IMOs and your labs are in conjunction. You can easily make them together. And, and there you've got four components that you can have within two weeks if you start them all at the same time. Within two weeks, you can be rolling with nutrients. And, and then you can adapt and, and push the IMO further. And a month later, you're going to have soil as well that now you can with your next run you know you're flipping and re-amending soil with imo based soil and then you're just applying all your things internally uh yeah i think those four things would be pretty much your your quick go-to's to to be more successful than running one thing individually you're going to run into some kind of an issue
Yeah, I love it, man. I mean, diversity is is key. I, I always say that about organics: diversity, diversity, diversity. And if you if you're new to K and F and you're wondering about some of those terms, uh, IMO is indigenous microorganisms. It's something that you will go locally and collect in your area. There's some great videos on that. And then uh, what was the other one? Uh, labs is uh, lactobacillus. That's a uh, culture that you'll take from basically the air. It'll take and uh, pull all these uh, bacteria in, and they're tremendously beneficial for your plants. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Talking about routine now, uh, do you have a set routine that you follow for each grow or is it, you know, every time you're doing something a little bit different, you're doing that experimentation? Tell me about that. I love experimentation. Yeah. Just because I love learning, you know, and I, I hear so many people are like, no, you got to do it this way. You know, well, no, you don't. You know, you can, there's 10 thousand ways to do this. There is no one set way to to grow. You know, we yeah. all have our methods and we all need to embrace each other and support. And one of my closest friends out in Colorado, Alex, land of Terps, man, dude's filing for rec, knows all the big boys. He's uh, he is such a rad dude. And, and our growth styles are different. And, and I love it because anytime I have a question on, uh, on a similar style to his, that's my dude you know, and, and he knows it. And same thing with, with me, whenever it comes to organics, like if he needs something with organics or outdoor or whatever, he's calling me right out gate to ask about what a situation may be that he may run into. And, and I love that embracing of um, the, this, what we have that makes us different. And so yeah. I'm constantly changing things in my grow. And I try to stick on a routine as far as the days I do things. Uh, so I want to make sure that I, I am watering and, and doing my IPM. If I change it up, I'm at least doing it on the same day so that I don't fall behind because those, they'll come in on you fast <laughs> if, if you miss anything. Yeah. <laughs> to I be mean, so small and such little legs, man, that thing's just Especially hey, towards the end of the season and stuff, it starts getting a little colder. Those critters are trying to get inside. Yep. Uh, IPM, folks, it's so important. <laughs> all right, Smokey. Well, you know, I've been asking you all sorts of questions for the last 45 minutes here. You're blowing my mind with all this awesome knowledge. But why don't you tell us where people can find you online? Uh, well, you can find me as uh, Smoky Ridge Organics. I have uh, Smoky Ridge Genetics as well. That one's... Uh, I just started that because I've never really wanted to sell my seed until I'm just starting to get through. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll sell my seed. I've, I've run it enough. I've done it enough and, and doing that. So I'm just starting to dabble. I want to make sure that everything's right as we all should, you know, if we're going to put, that's a major responsibility, man. I've seen some, yeah. some pitiful runs, especially in this CBD thing that's happening and buying genetics and things. And it's really sketchy and there's some really shady people and I've met them and I've dealt with great people and amazing people who put the time in. And uh, I feel like uh, doing the same thing, you know, putting the time in and making sure it's good is before we get that. But yeah, I mean, uh, Instagram, Smoky Ridge Organics, you can find me on Facebook, just Cole Kernstein, um, anywhere and all, all the places, man. Oh, right on, right on. Well, Smokey, Love chatting with you today. Definitely want to do this again because I want to have to meet the industry because I know there's a whole other facet of things that we can talk about for sure. Oh, yeah. But for that sure. being said, last question of the day, and this is the one I ask everybody, what's the next big thing for cannabis? Next big thing for cannabis. Um, I feel like it's going to be the collabs that are happening yeah. between some of these major players. Um, uh, the, the big people that are in there bringing things in. I also think that the water soluble is going to be a big a big player a lot of people that's super convenient uh, i've seen a lot of stuff happening with that the water soluble stuff it's uh uh real easy to get in and and do all that i think there's a lot of a lot of future with that but you know the mixed the single cannabinoid profiles and things i'm not really backing and you got to have a lot of that in some of those micronized forms but um, I'd say the water solubles are pretty fun, you know, getting in, you got the teas, you've got all that stuff. You can make mixed drinks and, and the edibles, man. I think just your edible lines are, are getting fun. I'm working on some right now that we're going to be doing and releasing with our shop that, that I think are going to be like super fun. And, and, uh, you know, that, that I'm really excited about the, the creativity that people have with, within the food industry. You know, there's a, a restaurant down the street from us that, He's going in. I, I'm in that uh, Gangier certification with uh, Kev, Jodri, and all, all the guys over there. And those are some, 
I was lucky enough to meet those guys a long time ago. I had no idea who they were at the time. And then I learned quickly who they were. But uh, this guy who's in another Ganji certification, and he's uh, a chef, and we're going to do some collabs on that. And so I, I think the food industry within it is going to be a great way for us also to break into this, breaking the stigma. Yes. Classy dinners that are uh, done up really well, but uh, accented with cannabis. And I, I just look forward to what that can be. Uh, there's there's like just just a whole new world when we get oh. into talking about edibles and stuff and there's so much excitement around that i hope to be doing more around that myself uh in the near future as well uh but that being said smoky wonderful chatting with you today brother i just again knowledge bombs stellar stellar stuff uh and guys go check him out on insta if uh, you're not following him already otherwise we'll have you back again on meet the industry real soon Excellent. look forward to it all right. That being said, guys, Smokey Ridge Organics, meet the grower. We out.